Hi, folks. Welcome to another installment of Bates Botanical Boot Camp. Today, this week, we'll be talking to you about plant tags and what you can do to decipher more information from those. You know, if you're tuning in, you're probably asking yourself, you know, how much more could you really get out of this little tiny piece of paper? And that's really the intention of why they do what they do in the first place, because they're only given you know, this tiny little tag in order to give you a good profile over the plant you may potentially buy. So, obviously, it's a profile. It's just a description at a glance. And a lot of the information is going to be generalized on there because plants are living, breathing things, and they adapt you know, to environment, to whatever temperatures and light exposures they deal with, the water and the ground they deal with, how thick the soil. So all these are different factors that play into really understanding what a tag can truly tell you and when you know that they're only giving you, you know, a little bit of brief description that's not really that much detail. So just for starting out, you know, we could just look at an example of a tag. Say I have here a little sea of gold juniper tag. So they give you a nice little picture. Yeah, that's pretty common. Yeah, I'm sure if you've been here, you've seen any Prelin nursery, really. You've been in, you've seen how they provide you a little picture to give you a brief idea of what the plant might look like. But there's always much more information on the inside. You know, looking in here, they'll give you information on light, what you need to do for watering. You know, so this is a, a really critical part of every tag that, you know, definitely leaves a lot of people with a lot of questions sometimes is, here it's listed as average size. Now, this is something that could be listed as the mature size. I've seen Monrovia tags sometimes say they'll give you a, a plant size after about its 10th year of growth. You know, that's all differing things. You know, a lot of times as well you'll get, you know, the bloom time on there, the hardiness zones, which we'll go over later. Um, sometimes even Monrovia is good about giving you a lot of extra little details like landscape, recommended landscape uses, uh, special features such as deer resistance and you know, how colorful the foliage is, how, whatever ornamental capabilities you'll get with this certain plant. And so understanding what more there is to know from these tags also involves a lot of common terminology that, you know, say we'll just look on here at this boxwood here. It's a green velvet boxwood. And so, again, it's a Monrovia tag. Now, say we're just starting out with, you know, it's light needs. Here it lists the light needs as full sun or six hours plus of direct sunlight partial sun it can also take three to six hours of sunlight and so again plants are living things and so when you get those numbers that's just to kind of give you a general consensus of what full sun means what partial sun means and that's what's good about the monrovia tags they kind of tell you that but those sun exposures you know there's also something that can differ you know depending on whether or not you're getting morning sun for six hours versus afternoon sun especially in the summers here in tennessee i mean as hot and sweltering as it gets so that's all certain things to keep in mind you know we can look at some of these other tags. You know, flowerwood is another nursery we get, you know, plants from very often. And when they let their light needs, it doesn't really give you that number. All it says is full sun to part shade on this Eliagnus plant. And so you can see that here. And so that's why it's important, you know, over time you'll start to read some of these tags and you'll see a lot of common things. You know, in terms of light terminology, full sun typically means six plus hours. Three to six hours is more like partial shade. Sometimes they'll list it as four to six. It, a lot of variations, you know, as you'll learn, you'll learn to see how that depends on your environment. And so, we can look in here as well. So, on this boxwood as well, for the watering needs, it lists water regularly, weekly, or more often in extreme heat or containers. Now, this is something too. Watering, which we have, you know, done a webinar on watering in the past. Watering is a very, it depends on lots and lots of different factors, you know, which we've gone over before, so... You know, knowing what the plant needs, there's a lot of times it just comes through, you know, your own personal practice. And really that's what it comes down to with a lot of these tags in the first place is just, you know, the ability to, to derive more information on these tags come with, you know, your own personal research you do, your know, secondhand accounts from other people who've grown or just your own growing experiences. You know, nothing's, you know, a teacher-like experience, and that's going to help you learn more about how to actually get some real information from these tags when they don't give you enough. And so coming back to what's listed next on this tag is average size. Again, that's something that can be listed in many different ways. You know, going back to this Ellie Agnes tag we had, it had the dimensions listed on here, just 8 by 10 high, 8 by 10 wide. That's just giving you a general description there. And so all that stuff was dimensions. That may lead you to believe that's as big as this plant will get. That's not necessarily true. 
you know, again, if these plants are happy and they're living, you're giving them the best shot they can have to, to survive and thrive, then they'll probably continue to do so. Many plants, you know, sometimes they could just be listing how big this plant may get before that growth really starts to kind of, you know, if you were to look at that growth on the graph, it starts to kind of level out. You know, sometimes that may be the case for this, say, 8 to 10 feet for this Eliagnus. Other times when they mention, you know, it's average size or garden size, I've seen it listed as, that could just also mean that's a, a way, a size that people commonly maintain this plant at and help. They can, ma- can maintain it and keep it healthy and in a nice shape. So it's not always that mature size. And I'm kind of looking here to see if maybe we have some other examples here where they might list something different. In fact, you know, I have a little sycamore tree tag. You know, these are pretty blank here from this grower. They'll give you a lot more information on the back. You know, just for average height and width is, is listed on here. It says 75 t- feet tall by 75 feet wide. Again, their sycamores would probably get 100 plus more feet. You know, that's a lot of variance in there technically, but it's, again, that's just kind of giving you a, a general idea of how big this tree will get. And, you know, that kind of brings up another point here is a lot of times knowing what to infer based on just these general descriptors, such as, you know, moderate growing, you know, a lot of times that depends on just knowing what kind of class that plant falls into. See, we're just looking at, you know, a tag about a tree, a sycamore tree in particular, which is a very fast growing, very massive plant. You know, you can compare that to say, you know, here we have a little purple pixie laurel petal, if you can maybe see that in the shot. So this is a low-growing, weeping bush and kind of spreads out as well. And even just in general, if you're thinking of shrubs and more compact shrubs like this, you know, when you start to think of, you know, the idea of something being moderate growing, that usually comes more into the realm of, you know, maybe an, a foot and a half or between a foot and a half to two feet of growth every year. That's probably more along the lines of something moderately growing as a uh, as a shrub rather than say a tree which modern going could mean two feet could mean three feet you know it all just kind of depends and you'll learn as you go a lot of times with a lot of these plants to really know what to infer so <clears throat> again knowing what category they fall in um so i'm taking a look at a couple of notes here you know another Aspect of this is just knowing your environment that you're planting in. You know, you know, if you've lived here your whole life, you know a lot what to expect as far as climate. But it's obviously it's honestly not even just climate that affects things. It, you know, it could be geology, geography. You know, the, the dirt in the ground, the, the kind of formations of the land around you. You know, because this brings up a good segue into our next point to kind of bring up on these uh, tags here, as they mentioned hardiness zones. And if you're familiar with hardiness zones. That kind of lets you know, usually it's listed as cold hardiness. There are also uh, heat hardiness zones, but most of the time what we deal with here, just because the winters aren't very long and intense here, they're usually referring to the cold hardiness. And so, for example, if we go back to this boxwood here, it lists the USDA cold hardiness zones as four through nine. So those are the zones that thrives well. And, and where we are here, you know, we're kind of on the cusp of zones six and seven here so it's a little weird and it's just kind of you know you also learn and it's easier you know obviously if you've been here for a while it's important to keep in mind just the unique position we are here in middle tennessee we get a lot of microclimates we get a lot of cold winds and from the midwest especially during the winter time so plants where you know you might technically be in zone seven but you know sometimes the winters you deal with could feel more like zone six or worse, or color, I should say, not necessarily worse. And so using these plant tags, they can you know, definitely provide you that idea of, you know, how cold hardy this plant should be. And oftentimes they will, even this one here will list you the average minimum temperatures that it can take. You know, for example, this boxwood says it can go down to negative 20 to negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit. But, you know, unlikely to reach that here. But one thing to keep in mind when you start dealing with those plants that get a little bit closer to where they might say, Zero to negative 10 degrees is what they can take. And I think even, for example, like a Laura Petalum, I have a tag here. It says USDA uh, cold hardiness is on seven. So that's one of those plants that's kind of on the cusp with how well it will thrive here. And, 
you know, planted something like this, this is a situation where if you wanted to plant a plant like this, seeing where on the tag where it says zone seven and you're worried about cold hardiness, you may want to plant it somewhere, say, against a wall where it can be protected from a northwestern exposure, which is where a lot of those winds come in from the wintertime. And that way, you're giving your plant a better shot to overwinter as you get it established. So that kind of takes us through a lot of the main bullet points of these tags here. So, again, it's important to keep in mind where we are here in Middle Tennessee and how we deal with things. You know, I originally come here myself from Middle Georgia, and I used to work at another plant nursery down there. And they asked me when I first came here, you know, what kind of plants did you sell down there? And I would tell them, oh, you know, gardenias, laura petalums, tea olives, Indian hawthorn bushes. And they you know, kind of chuckle as those are all plants that can be a little marginal in this area. So it's important to, you know, despite the fact that where I come from in Middle Georgia, as far as climate, really isn't all that different from here. You know, just the geography and how close we are to the Midwest and the fact that we're up on a plateau, we get a lot of winds. It definitely plays a, a substantial effect in the winters and overwintering plants here that where I'm from might be a lot easier to deal with. And so one important thing also we're going to point out, let's see, we'll pull out this uh, little golden mugo pine for an example. Karsten's winter gold mugo pine. Another important thing to remember here, and this is really helpful as you'll do kind of your learning and as you're doing your gardening, and I'll see I can point it out here with my finger. Up top here, under the, the name, we'll give you the botanical name of the plant, in this case, Pinus mugo, which this is a specific cultivar called, again, Kars Carson's Winter Gold. And so that botanical name is actually a very useful tool it is something that can be used as a descriptor for learning common botanical terminology and helps distinguish similar, similar plants more efficiently. It's, you know, commonly it's going to be in Latin, and therefore you'll start to also see a lot of common words used in those species names, and that helps you help just uh, distinguish plants. For example, if you're shopping for hydrangeas, we get this a lot. During the summer, it's usually a little easier for us. You know, most people love that limelight hydrangea. It's a full sun hydrangea. If you look at the botanical name of that, the genus and species will be listed as um, Hydrangea paniculata, whereas the pine here was listed as Pinus mugo, that Hydrangea paniculata lets you know this is that category, the species of Hydrangea called paniculata, and those are the ones that can take full sun very easily. So when you start looking at other Hydrangeas like the oak leaves or Hydrangea quercifolia, you know, a lot of the more colorful ones that bloom different shades of blues and pinks are usually hydrangea macrophylla. Um, those are all little ideas that you may not know what those words exactly mean, but you can at least put them in a category because those would be those hydrangeas that all behave in very similar ways. And it's a very true for a lot of plants in general. You'll start to notice that they all fall under certain species, and you can kind of file those away in your head and remember, hey, this is what this type of species does. <clears throat> And thus, too, it will also just kind of help you, like I said, if you learn a little bit more of what those words mean, actually. For example, I just mentioned hydrangea macrophylla. That macrophylla literally just means big leaf. And so that's another thing that also helps you kind of infer a little bit more from a plant because you know that means big leaf. You go, oh, this hydrangea has bigger leaves than most other hydrangeas. And so, you know, for another example, when you look at roses, you often come across grandiflora. That typically means a big bloom. Or a florabunda is another species that typically means an abundance of flowers. So those are another another really helpful tool that you know I, personally I use a lot to really help me kind of learn a little bit more about a plant without diving too deep in on the internet or just you know looking at a glance. The whole point of why we're looking at tags in the first place just to get a brief idea and get as much information from that little bit as you can. And so obviously. When it comes down to another just general great way, and most of these tags we'll have in, or most of our plants will have these, is just a general description of the plant. You know, for example, we have here, we have a Nandina here called the Tuscan Flame. And we'll just read off the, uh, the description. A compact, multi-stem, deciduous shrub, bamboo-like foliage emerges bright red, creating a nice contrast with older green foliage, dense, colorful plant, Looks great in borders, containers, or low hedges. Plant in moist, well-drained soil. So, there you go. A lot of these tags are just going to give you 
the easy mode, just the outright brief description. It's like, you know, it's like a resume. When you turn in your resume, you might have, that's going to be your brief descriptor for how you are as an employee when you're applying to different jobs. And that's what this plan is trying to do to you. It's trying to tell you a little bit about itself, you know, get you cited, really. But uh, ultimately, that's, you know, the goal when it comes to these plant tags. I mean, you know, we can kind of go through and look at a lot of these different plant tags and just how different they are. You know, for example, I have one for a Japanese snowbell here. This is mostly just a description and a couple extra bits about, you know, down here about how the size of the tree is expected to be or the and the, uh, the what they recommend for planting and spacing. But sometimes, you know, that might be all you need, especially in the case of trees. A lot of times, mostly what you know is the general size class it falls into. Is it a 20 to 30 footer, 40 to 50, and 60, 70 plus tall tree? You know, most times what you're looking for with those. And, you know, obviously there's certain trees that, you know, might be better suited for a wet landscape like a dawn redwood or a bald cypress. But those are things, you know, Sometimes the, the plant tags, especially, with, again, with those watering needs, they won't give you that specific information to let you know this is something that can handle a lot of water. But, you know, at the end of the day, what basically is going to help you with these tags is just learning more about the plants. And as I said, that comes through, you know, your own personal experience or just listening to what others tell you, you know. And honestly, that's the point of, you know, what you come in here for to shop and talk to us is to kind of give you better ideas of what works well and especially in our area. <clears throat> So ultimately, that's just, you know, the idea. The plant tags provide a, a brief description of a plant that can actually be interpreted to better understand a plant's habits, its needs, etc., which is something that becomes easier as you gain more experience, and that's the point we want to get across today. And uh, I believe that's about as much as I can really impart to you today. And there's obviously little specific things that may be better with questions, so... So we might just go ahead and go to questions. Sure. Um, we haven't gotten many questions yet. We have someone asking about azaleas, if we have any on hand and about those. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we always have plenty of azaleas in, especially the Encore series. Um, I think I just saw we got some gumpo azaleas in this morning, which are the dwarf variety with the really small leaves, but also deciduous. But, yes, we have azaleas, definitely. That's usually something we carry a lot of. Uh, Beautiful evergreen bloomer, always sought after in the southeast, pretty much anywhere. And the um, in the encore, do you better in the sun? Is that that's the way? That's from what my experience and understanding is. They do seem to do better in full sun. And again, those are the ones that will generally give you more blooms throughout the year than other azalea types. You know, obviously those are meant to bloom spring and autumn, especially, and give you some errant blooms throughout the summer as well. Really nice series of azaleas. Right. I think we opened up an azalea Pandora's box. Um, mm. Someone's asking if azaleas can be transplanted and what when is best to do that. Yeah, I mean, azaleas are pretty easy in that sense. Um, anytime, really, the best time to transplant is, is generally going to be when the temperatures are cooler. You know, even winter may be the easiest, I'd say, just because most things are more dormant and you just risk shocking the plant a lot less then. And just, you know, dealing with that heat when you transplant into the new ground just the summers here are usually like the biggest trial for most plants is just uh, dealing with those hot, sweltering summers. So to give your plants the best shot while transplanting, I always wait to the cooler seasons, you know, late fall, winter, right before, well, that's still, yeah, probably say just late fall, winter, be the most safe. Um, and then someone's asking, do we have a lot of dwarf plants? Well, absolutely. And that, that's a good point that uh, I kind of forgot to mention you know, dwarf is a very is a relative term, and if you ever talk to any of us here, they someone's probably mentioned that to you because, you know, just for example here, I got to the left of me a little gem magnolia, which technically is a dwarf magnolia tree, and again, because the term dwarf is relative, a normal magnolia tree could get 60, 70 feet high at maturity, and this one is technically a dwarf because it's supposed to mature at a shorter size, but still... This is still a, a tree that's expected to get about 40 to 50 feet tall. So, you know, obviously dwarf is a relative term. If you were looking, say, for magnolia, there's, I know there's a variety called the teddy bear, which is supposed to be more like a 20 to 30 footer. But to answer your question, yes, we definitely have a lot of dwarf plants around here. And, you know, again, depending on which, you know, kind of category of plants you're talking about, whether it's trees or shrubs or even going further, what kind of 
plant, you know, if you're talking about magnolias, if you're talking about um, boxwoods, what determines what is dwarf is all based off of that mother species. So because a magnolia can get 60, 70 feet high traditionally, a lot of those southern magnolia varieties, the little gem's technically a dwarf, but, you know, a lot of people don't think of 40 to 50 feet being dwarf, <laughs> but that's the case. So, yes, we have a lot of dwarf plants. All right. Well, uh, I want to thank you guys for tuning in with us again this week. Uh, we really appreciate you. And next week, you want to tune in again. This will be a really interesting webinar. We have Ben. He's going to do a webinar on camellias. You know, this time of year, we get a lot of interest for camellias. They're one of the most beautiful evergreen blooming plants there is. Another thing, like I mentioned, can be a little, you know, kind of on the cusp of where, you know, a lot of goes into where you decide to plant it to protect it from those cold winters. But Ben will go a lot more in depth on that next week, and uh, it should be a really good show for you. Well, well, thank you all for tuning in.